But first, joining me is Julianne and Michael Cusick. Julianne stayed with Michael even after he had told her he had been seeing prostitutes and using porn compulsively. Julianne, I want to start with your story. Now, take us back to the beginning when you and Michael began dating, and then take us through your marriage and ultimately this confession. How did that go down? Well, first, uh, wow, that's a big question. Um, thank you, Dr. Drew, for having us here. And let's see, uh, we met, uh, we were living in different states when we met, so the backdrop would be he was living in Ohio, I was living in Florida. We met out here in Colorado, and it was love at first sight. So I didn't really believe in love at first sight until it actually happened to me. So our courtship, our um, engagement was long distance. We got engaged about two months after we had met. Um, our viewing audience might be thinking, she's crazy. That's what my boss told me. Uh, it was very unusual for me. I was pretty methodical, thought out, well-planned individual, and just and knew Julianne, my I understanding is, man I was going to marry. And Julianne, my understanding is he actually made a confession to you at the time of your engagement. Is that right? And yet you continue to uh, follow through. Yes, actually, it was about two months after we were engaged. And he said, there's something, you know, I need to tell you. I want you to know about this. And he told me about some addiction issues that he had had since he was a teen. He told me he was in counseling, in therapy, working on those. He said, I would understand if you wanted to break off, you know, if I wanted to break off the engagement. And I said, no, if you're dealing with this and you're in therapy, um, I will stand by you. You know, I'll go ahead and we can get married. Um, but that's it. I mean, no more acting out, pornography, or whatever after we're married. I was very uncomfortable with that and was very clear that that wasn't something I would be interested in and then what happened? Uh, him doing after we were married. Well, uh, fast forward, we got married, moved out to Colorado. Uh, the first year of our marriage, I worked while he was getting his master's degree. And, you know, it wasn't until the third year of our marriage that um, I found out. So we had been married, just celebrated three years of marriage um, when I did find out about his slip into his secret life in the second year of our marriage. So... Um, How did you find you out? Know, the first year of our marriage, well, um, he, he was out working. He had an on-call job. He'd get paid. She'd have to go in and do clinical assessments. And I was back at the apartment, got a call. He was out. He called me, and he said, I've got a second call and I, that I'm going to stay out for. So no problem. Until 20 minutes later, he walked in the front door. And I said, wait a minute. You, what are you doing home? And uh, he said, I was done with my call. And I said, how could you be done with your call? You just told me you had a second call. And he kind of stammered, uh... And he said, well, I said I, I said I maybe had a call. I knew that was a lie. I said, you don't maybe have a call. You either have a call or you did, don't did have a call. Did you already Which have some sort of instinct that something was really wrong? I mean, to just nail him because of a, you know, sort of inconsistency in where he said he was going, but to really zero in, you must have known something was up. Well, actually, I never would have suspected and didn't suspect that there was something... Uh, sexual going on, a sexual addiction, a secret life, lies, absolutely not. I am a stickler, though, on what you say. <laughs> and so maybe I had a call, didn't, didn't cut it, and I did, and then I'm home, didn't cut it. That had never happened. Just didn't make sense to me. So now if you want to know what the nature of a relationship was like, were there clues something was amiss? Absolutely. I mean, he would say that he loved me, but I didn't feel loved. I felt like he was angry at me all the time. I felt like he hated me. So in that way, yes, I knew something was wrong. I mean, a relationship, our married relationship for three years had not been easy. It had been difficult. Uh, it seemed like we disagreed on everything. You know, if it was my way, it was, a, it was a problem. If it was his way, you know, I was a little resistant. So we had to really work through things a lot. I think my only clue was... 
I didn't feel loved. I felt crazy that he would say he loved me, but I didn't feel it. And then, and then you decided once, so, once he did uncover this, this compulsion was active again, he was acting out, you decided to stay with him. I want to go to Michael. Michael, you wrote a book about this, and it's called Surfing for God. Uh, we got about a couple minutes here. I want you to just sort of sketch your story out for me, if you would. To start with this, how bad did it get? It got really bad, Dr. Drew. I was, uh, the background very quickly is I was born into an Irish Catholic alcoholic family. My father didn't get sober until uh, the second grade. And in that family, through an uncle, I was sexually abused. And that profoundly confused me in terms of sexuality and intimacy and shame was embedded deep inside of me. And I was utterly ill-equipped as I went through my adolescence and into early adulthood to have an intimate relationship with another human being. The problem was, was that I was relationally pretty skilled and relatively charming and I was in ministry and so I could relate to people and it looked like I was this really great relational person but I was really hiding behind a facade. And uh, so the deeper I slipped into the sexual addiction, uh, it went from pornography to to all the way up to prostitutes and paying for uh, sexual relationships. Was there a bottom to this? I mean, did it, did it, I mean, give us a, paint a picture for us as when you, what you were doing at your worst. Uh, the bottom really was the day that uh, I was discovered, July 10th, 1994. No, I'm not, I guess, I guess that's that not that my, not, I, yeah, what, what were you doing? Because I mean, people don't understand where sexual addiction takes people. And it's never, if you're comfortable telling right. us this, yeah. you know, where, sure. where did it go? Where yeah, did it I take mean, you? Mean, so far from who you actually were, where did it take you? Sure. Yeah, the double life looked like this. On the outside, I was this minister and squeaky clean uh, pastor by day. And pre-internet, I would go to adult bookstores and video arcades where one would access pornography and hope to encounter uh, physical relationships. I would go to bars and I would drink excessively and abuse alcohol. I would go to strip clubs and massage parlors and then ultimately it took me to uh, both high-priced escort services and uh, the alleys and back roads seeking prostitutes and one of the things um, about the addiction was I became more and more deceptive uh, I would take very very long lunch hours and I would try to uh, be deceptive as to where I was and um, I would have to drink on my lunch hour as a way of dealing with the shame and the anxiety and I really really became very out of control okay guys thank you for sharing the story we're going to talk more about the story from Mike from Michael and Julianne's perspective